Lieutenant Alan Dawson was trying to locate the enemy's positions without putting his head in the path of a bullet. Pinned down in dense elephant grass, he knew the North Vietnamese were zeroing in on them, not so much by the sound, but more ominously by the fact that the enemy's fire was now chopping down the vegetation concealing the team. It's about time you got back. How is Da Nang? Dawson asked as Sergeant Rogers slid into the bar stool next to him. It's a beachfront wonderland, LT, but I wouldn't want to be there. The guys on the teams have to put up with an awful lot of bullshit from people who don't have a clue. Oh, what, you mean it's like the army? Yeah, the only good part is they don't let officers in the club. They laugh. Without officers, who's going to pay your bill? The only reason you pay my bill is because I keep your ass alive, LT. On the exfiltration of their last operation, the Vietnamese King Bee pilot cleared the trees and violently flipped the H-34 on its side. Dawson, sitting in the door, felt himself go weightless and for a split second realized he was going to fall right the hell out of the helicopter. A firm grip on his web gear pulled him back. He turned to see Roger shaking his head in mock disgust. What are you up to, LT? I'm going to take the radio for a walk again, this time with a recon team. The one zero is an E6 named Peterson. Short guy, probably only an inch taller than you. Dawson winced as Rogers without turning to look, punched him in the arm, spilling some of his beer. Keep carrying the radio and you're going to get promoted to PFC, Lieutenant. Yeah, well, I figure the experience can't hurt. We spent this afternoon practicing immediate action drills. They sat in silence for a while. Then Rogers turned serious. You know, you can never get enough experience, LT. By the time you think you have Charlie figured out, he just does something different. The trick is to be able to make up shit on the fly. Dawson stared at the pinup tattoo on Roger's forearm. The sergeant had earned the right to his opinion the hard way. On the day Dawson arrived in country, Rogers had been the only survivor of a seven-man recon operation. The next morning, Dawson met up with Sergeant Peterson, his assistant team leader spec for Mars, and the four nuns he had trained with the day before. He got the radio he would carry, put in a fresh battery, made a commo check, and crammed it into his small indige backpack, carefully feeding the whip antenna through a slit in the top flap so it couldn't be seen making him a target. Peterson gave him a map. It had been carefully folded, showing the six-square-kilometer target area through the clear plastic case. It could be any mountain jungle in the world, but in this case, Dawson knew it was in Laos. It really didn't make any difference. When the helicopter arrived at the landing zone, he'd get off and ask Covey, the forward air controller, for the team's location. If they left the LZ walking uphill to the north, hopefully the map would agree. If it didn't, an interesting conversation with Covey would follow. The weather was cooperating, so their mid-morning launch should be a go, but at the last minute they were informed that a team had declared an emergency, and they were on hold until the extraction was completed. They waited purposely keeping mostly to themselves. Pre-mission jitters, combined with nothing to do, made it easy to get on each other's nerves. They finally assembled on the runway at 1,400 hours, but the helicopters didn't show up for another hour. They flew west. Peterson pointed out the Ashau Valley. They continued into Laos. Over the target, the troop carrier flew in a wide circle as a gunship skimmed over a large green area near the edge of the jungle. They didn't draw any fire, so the insertion began. Their chopper went into a swerving dive. After several maneuvers, it rapidly slowed and then hovered a few feet above the ground. The team jumped into the elephant grass and quickly took up defensive positions. As the noise of the helicopter cleared from his ears, Dawson radioed at Team OK, got their location, and showed it to Peterson. Oh shit, this isn't the LZ I requested. Let's get into the tree line. They moved quickly through the elephant grass to the cover of the jungle, then cautiously continued straight up the hill through thick vegetation. It was 1,600 hours. Peterson pulled out his map. You figure we're here? Yeah, there should be a trail 100 meters west, Dawson replied. Okay, let's move east away from the trail and find a place to set up. He signaled Morris and the team formed up and moved out slowly and silently. Under single canopy, the ground vegetation was thick. At times, visibility extended as far as 10 meters, most of the time less than half of that. 
Thirty minutes later, the team had only moved about 150 meters. They found a small knoll consisting of dense foliage and trees with thick trunks. They ran a quick patrol to ensure there weren't any trails in the area. Finding nothing, they returned to the knoll. Morris immediately placed the nuns into a perimeter and put out the claymores. They were set up for the night. At this latitude, it got dark fast. More like God just turned off the lights. Dawson opened his eyes and looked up through the trees. The sky was a couple of shades lighter than the black jungle. He didn't even realize he had fallen asleep. He started to hear the nungs move. In a few minutes, with more light, he could see them with weapons at the ready. Remaining vigilant, the nungs started eating. On Mars' signal, they retrieved the claymores and repacked them. We're ready to roll, he said quietly. We'll head east and let the terrain dictate when we turn south, Peterson directed. They walked in a semi-crouch, careful not to make a sound or leave any tracks, pausing now and again to listen intently for any foreign sound. Their weapons swept the area as if attached to the movement of their eyes. Traveling at a rate of only 20 steps per minute, up and down steep hills and the sides of ridge lines with their heavy loads was grueling work. In order to move 100 meters on the map, they were forced to walk two or three times that distance because of the unevenness of the terrain. Just before noon, the point man signaled a halt. Peterson moved forward and quickly returned. He motioned Dawson to move up with him as Mars put the team in defensive positions. After a few meters, they came upon a trail. It was wide and well-worn, capable of supporting not only foot traffic, but bicycles and small carts. Jesus Christ, Dawson said softly. Yeah, we've definitely got plenty of company, Peterson replied, as he said about taking photos and making detailed notes, a task not often reported, but that was, in fact, the main job of a recon team. They crossed the trail, careful to cover their footprints, and continued east. Now knowing that the enemy was in the area, their movements were even slower and quieter than before. Trung sĩ muốn chúng ta quay trở lại căn cứ trước khi thuyền trường đến. The team froze. All heads turned to the right. When he was sure they were gone, Peterson motioned Morris over. What do you think? My guess is the trail we crossed probably curved to the east, and now it's right there. We just didn't see it. Yeah, unless that's another trail, then we could be in the middle of a base camp. I don't want to move much further east until we know what we're dealing with. They sure as hell aren't looking for us, Dawson added. Where's an LZ? Peterson asked. Dawson checked his map. Nothing north. Looks like there's elephant grass about a click due south. <coughs> the radio squelched. Dawson reached for the handset. Peterson shook his head. It's Covey. Let him wait. It'll keep him in the area. Let's set up on the trail for a while and see what happens. No sooner were they in position when a squad of North Vietnamese walked by. How many did you count? Peterson whispered. Five, maybe six. I could hardly see them, Dawson replied. I'm going to move up a little bit to get a better view. Make damn sure they can't see you. Got it. Dawson crawled up a few feet and took out a magazine and put it on the ground in front of him, just in case. He lay there staring at the trail. He wondered if Morris had their rear covered. He wondered what they were going to do next. After an hour, he mostly wondered how long they were going to keep it up. The nun to his right put his hand to his throat. Dawson passed the sign to Peterson and aimed his rifle at the trail as pressure built up in his ears. This time he could see them, moving easily. They were silent, but certainly not alert. He counted and saw one had a B-40. Dawson fired a short burst at the soldier in front of him then emptied the magazine in the direction of the trail, and reloaded. It was over in a few seconds. Now he wondered why the hell they had fired. Peterson moved the team across the road as he took photos of the downed enemy. They pushed into the jungle heading south, moving at a pretty good clip. After a few minutes, Peterson stopped and turned to Dawson. You know how to call an emergency? Yeah, Dawson replied. Do it. Now? Right now. Peterson moved off to talk to Morris. Cubby, this is hard case, over. Cubby, Cubby, this is hard case. Hey there, hard case. Where you been, over? 
We made contact. I'm declaring a prairie fire emergency. Over. Roger that. Do you have casualties? Negative. Can you give me your position? Over. We're heading to an LZ approximately 1.5 clicks east and one click south of our last position. Wait one. Elephant grass over. That's it. We're a click north and closing. There's a lot of bad guys down here. We may need spads. Over. Roger that hard case. Guns are standing by. I'll see what I can do. I got enough fuel so I'm here if you need me. I'll get back to you with the ETA of the extraction. Roger that. Thanks. You keep your heads down. Stay safe. They moved quickly, more ready to fight than hide. In a half hour, they were nearing the LZ. The ground cover thinned out and visibility increased. A shot was fired from directly in front of them. How far was anybody's guess? Spread out, Peterson called the Mars. They moved out, focusing their firepower forward. The immediate action drills they practiced weren't an option now. Any resistance would be met with force. Another shot was fired. What are they doing? Dawson asked Peterson. They're trying to turn us. Slow us down while they round up a hunting party. They kept moving. A North Vietnamese soldier appeared out of nowhere. The Nung shot him. They moved on and in seconds reached the end of the forest and entered dense 8 to 10 foot elephant grass. There's a road, Peterson said, pulling Dawson back into the jungle. It appeared as a tunnel. High up, the trees were cleverly tied together, camouflaging it from the sky. Peterson took pictures. From a long way off in the shadows, someone fired a few ineffective rounds at them. They pushed into the elephant grass, leaving a trail a blind man could follow. A few minutes later, they came to a halt. Peterson switched backpacks with Dawson, ending his job as the radio operator. Knock down the grass so Covey can find us, he instructed, as he spoke on the radio. See if you can get a mirror on Covey. Dawson took out his signal mirror and searched the sky for Covey. When he came into view, Dawson looked through the mirror, locating the dot on the wall of elephant grass, and raised it up until it reflected on Covey's windshield. Okay, he's got us, Peterson called out. The assets are 20 minutes out. Fubai was 50 miles away. Helicopters flew at over 100 miles an hour. It had been 40 minutes since he had called the emergency. Perhaps standing by didn't include minor essentials like being gassed up and armed, Dawson thought. They heard automatic weapons fire from their northwest. Cubby says he's taking fire. Tell him there's a war going on down here, Morris responded. While the team set up their claymores, the North Vietnamese weren't idle. Slowed down by their lack of radios, runners had alerted troops that were now converging on the elephant grass field, firing blindly. They pushed themselves closer to the ground as a couple of RPD machine guns methodically sought them out, shredding the grass above their heads, then moving on, only to return, like the comings and goings of a lawnmower. B-40 rounds began exploding. Dawson crawled over to watch their back trail. The situation held steady for about 10 minutes. Then Dawson saw them, just meters away, on the trail they left in the elephant grass. He kicked out at a nun behind him, who quickly moved to his side, and they opened fire, cutting down the enemy as they appeared. A second one joined them with a grenade launcher. A B-40 rocket was fired straight up the trail. It flew over their heads, exploding harmlessly. Dawson blew a claymore. Channelized, realizing they were sitting ducks, the NVA abandoned the trail and spread out, trying to flank them. Hundreds of bullets snapped through the grass, inches above the team, as the now invisible enemy fired accurately into their position. He's bringing in gunships. Give me a location, Peterson yelled. Tell him 315 degrees, 30 meters, Dawson Wilde asked Guest without raising his head. Covey fired a marker rocket. Firing immediately decreased as the enemy, knowing what was coming, ran for the safety of the jungle. Two gunships attacked the area. Slick coming in. They scrambled inside. The helicopter took off. Though still vulnerable, they all felt an immediate sense of relief and elation to be off the ground. I see you made it back in one piece, LT, Rogers said. Yeah, Cubby got there just in time. You learn anything? I learned that if the Cubby rider stops to take a crap, it can get you killed. Going home ain't all up to you, LT. When you planning on getting cleaned up? Figured I'd have a beer first. Besides, we weren't out there long enough to get dirty. Lieutenant Dawson? Yes, Smitty. 
Major Capper wants to see you. Okay, thanks. Guess the Major wants to tell you what a great job you're doing, LT. Yeah, that's probably it. In a couple of minutes, Dawson returned. I'm being reassigned to Mylock. Oh, you're going to love it, LT. Up by the DMZ in the middle of nowhere. Even the Marines are smart enough to stay out of that place. It's like a well-armed hobo camp. No toilets, no showers. You live in tents. Got about two strands of barbed wire between you and the NVA. Glad you like it, because you're going with me. You'll find my book Dawson's War worthwhile. Rather than just accounts of Mac Sog's operations, Dawson's War is the story of five men, three Americans and two Brew Mountain Yard mercenaries. I'll take you with us for a year. You'll get your fair share of gunfights in Laos, because we did. But Sog was so much more than gunfights. Sog was a brotherhood. And unless you experience the camaraderie these men shared, you really don't know Sog. Through Dawson's War, these five men will become your friends. And like I do, you'll miss them when it's over. In the end, you'll be able to answer Sog's most asked question. What kind of men ran these dangerous missions? Get a copy today at Amazon. Thanks. And as always, like and subscribe. It helps.